You know, for a supposed multi-species alliance, I can't help but notice that a lot of the ships of Starfleet are quite... human. Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today, well, you can tell from the opening and from the title, uh, that we're going to be looking at the really early Starfleet and understand why Starfleet ships are so... human. So, what's going on here? Uh, is it secretly that the Federation is actually a homo sapiens only club, as Azat Burr suggests? Or is there something more going on that leads to that appearance, but was not just because the human said everyone needs to use our designs and that's just the way it is? Well, let's look into it. Looking at Federation ships, particularly we're looking at the early Federation, so 22nd century, early 23rd century. I care less about the 24th century just because by that point you can assume that all the various species and designs have homogenized over the years and moved towards the point that we get to in Next Generation. But in the early Starfleet, it certainly bears a lot of questioning. Uh, where are the the alien members of the Federation? Where are their ships? Why do they not look alien at all? Why do they basically just look like human ships? What's going on here? So, there's two real theories that we can use to answer this question. There is the missing link theory, which I'll go into, or there's a reason why the Federation is using human designs and human-style ships. So first I want to go into the missing link theory. Now, it's worth saying that prior to the release of Enterprise, uh, this was just simply not a problem. We accept that the saucer design is a federation design, not necessarily a human design. Fans and artists like Masao Ukazaki designed a human fleet for the pre-federation era in his Starfleet Museum. These are very distinctive compared to the later federation designs, so the, the whole saucer nacelles and secondary hull arrangement is very clearly a federation design. It's very clearly a, um, a homogenization of the various styles of, of design compared to the earlier human designs, which were basically giant space zeppelins, tempered slightly by the time we get down to the Daedalus class, but the ships of the Romulan War were basically giant space zeppelins or submarines. But yeah, so essentially that was initially the supposition everyone ran under. And then Star Trek Enterprise came out and we got a ship that looked very much like the Enterprise that we'd be getting in TOS. It has a saucer, it has warp engines, the only thing it doesn't have is a secondary hull. But even in the later Enterprise books, they refit a secondary hull onto the NX class to make it very, very close to the Federation ships that we'll later see, which leaves very limited room for alien input. In the days prior to Star Trek Enterprise, the missing link theory definitely had some, some plausibility. Given what we've seen in Enterprise and beyond, we have to kind of dismiss the missing link theory, which leads us to the other conclusion. Okay, so Federation designs are human-style designs, but why is that? Why are they using human designs? Why are the other species of the Federation using human designs? Well, let's get into it, because I do have a theory as to why. The first thing to say is that the saucer design is not necessarily a human design, or is not necessarily an essentially human design. We'll get on to the other species in a bit, but I just want to point out that at the same time we have the NX class, we also have the Daedalus class, which is a sphere design. We also have the Warp Delta, which is, well, it's a Delta design. And if you want to go back even further and uh, reintroduce the Maseo Ukazaki ships as sort of pre-22nd century ships, which I think works reasonably well, then those are human designs. So defining what a human design is is not exactly clear at this point, and this will become important later. The first thing to mention is that there are unique technologies of all the founding races of the Federation. They all have different advantages in different areas of technology. Each have had centuries of individual technological development. So for the Tellarites, they have nacelles embedded into the prow section. For the Denobulans, it actually looks like they have vertically aligned warp nacelles. 
For Vulcans, you've got the annular warp rings. For Andorians, you've got their, their drive pods. All told, you have a lot of very different and disparate technologies that have all grown up separate from one another. They haven't really been intermixing. They're isolated technologies that don't necessarily have a lot in common with each other or a lot in the way of compatibility. So these are closed systems. And that's very important to remember. These are closed systems. These are designs in which it's very difficult to introduce alien technology and in which alien technology is not really that compatible. By contrast, humans have only been in space at this point just over a hundred years-ish, which is no time at all. So human technology hasn't exactly had a long time to individuate and develop its own quirks. It's very basic warp technology, which means it's very adaptable. It's very malleable. It's a very open format design. And this is important because it's not just about different engine designs, although that's a clear example between the different races. But there are different system structures in place. And there are different technologies that emphasize different things. You know, their economies have all developed, their technology and economies have developed to emphasize certain technologies over the others. So, for example, the Andorians have excellent shields. The Vulcans have very powerful tractor beams. The Denobulans have excellent sensor systems. The Tellarites, excellent communication arrays. These have all developed as a result of the different needs and technological uh, drives of these various races. They have evolved out of unique circumstances, but because they have all evolved separately, they can't really integrate with one another, at least directly. What they can potentially do is integrate with more primitive systems, like human designs, particularly if you're taking perhaps your last generation communications array, your new generation communications array is just too powerful for the for the NX class, but actually the last generation communications array, that will work quite nicely. In the episode Proving Ground, uh, Lieutenant Talus describes how uh, Enterprise is in many ways quite familiar to the old ships that she had trained on when she was going through the Academy. There's a little bit of a dig at Lieutenant Reed and, and the Enterprise, but it also shows that there's a fair amount in common, particularly when you get down to the more basic levels of technology. So, okay, we have human ships. They're relatively primitive compared to everyone else's, and they're not necessarily specialised and closed off in how they're designed. The design architecture and the design and the operating systems are quite open systems. Okay, that's all very well and good. But why is it that then, after the formation of the Federation, everyone adopts this style of design? Well, I've got two words for you. The Romulan War. So, as we can observe today, nations can be very, very proactive in arming and supplying their allies when they realise that they are next on the chopping block. It was very clear to the, to the races of the Coalition that if Earth fell the Romulans would be coming after them and next, and chances are there's the strategic position there. Earth lies between all of them, and it's a good jumping-off point to attack all these other races. It also prevents them from effectively coordinating with each other, and they're going to, the Romulans will absorb all the industrial infrastructure and resources of Earth. It's going to be easier for the races of the Coalition to supply Earth, who is currently fighting, than to focus on their own militaries you're being proactive in dealing with the threat. You're not waiting until it gets to your door. You're making sure that the first guy can beat the threat so that it doesn't even become a problem for you. So rather than investing resources into developing and expanding their own militaries for a future conflict for the Romulans, which the Romulans may or may not be able to uh, overwhelm them in, they instead agree that they'll all pull their resources into supporting Earth so that they make sure that Earth wins the Romulan War, and so that they don't ever have to worry about the Romulans again, which has some parallels to perhaps things that are going on today. So, during the Romulan Earth War, much of Earth's industrial infrastructure is either threatened or destroyed. It's not a reliable infrastructure. Even the Sol system itself was infiltrated by Romulan ships, and they did a fair amount of damage when they did. 
say nothing of the Earth colonies, most of which were at one point or another attacked or indeed just obliterated. So to put it bluntly, Earth does not have much in the way of resources and infrastructure with which to wage their war against the Romulans. However, the Coalition have been untouched by the Romulans. The Romulans don't want to start a war with them while they're fighting Earth, so they know that they can produce ships and equipment for Earth without being dragged into a war with the Romulans. It's just simply too much effort for the Romulans to attack them as well. They'll just be opening a whole can of whoop that they're not yet ready for. So, Earth was able to outsource its supply to the Coalition. And at the same time, the industrial base of the Coalition began to retool itself to create and supply, to build and support Earth-like ships. And again, that's relatively easy because these are not complex things. Earth ships are not complex. We're not asking you to build, we're not asking a Vulcan shipyard to build the most up-to-date Andorian battlecruiser. We're asking them to build Daedalus-class ships. And for the Vulcans, that's a, that's a piece of cake. Um, so what that ultimately means is that everyone's able to retool their economies and infrastructure to supply the humans with what they need. And the result is, is that by the end of the Romulan War and the founding of the Federation, all the member worlds of the Federation, all the founding members, already have the infrastructure to build these kinds of ships, these human type ships. But they also now have the knowledge of how to incorporate their technology more effectively into these designs and to individuate these designs a little bit more and fit them to their needs. So the result is, is that in the post-war world, we now have a shared infrastructure that's geared towards supplying Earth. You think if the coalition was going to become the Federation without the Romulan War and without that drive to uh, supply Earth with ships that they could use, if it wasn't for that motivator, it's very likely that it would have taken decades, if not centuries, for the various member races of the, of the Federation to all get their industrial infrastructure in line with one another. But the Romulan War meant that the, at the formation of the Federation, it was already all set up. And so when it came to building and expanding a Starfleet, I mean, that was that was a no-brainer. It's like, well, we've all got this stuff that we now all have in common. We all can build these ships, so let's all do it. And we'll still find a way to uh, incorporate design traits that we all individually like. But, you know, this is all the template that we have now agreed on. And that's ultimately a result of economics than anything else. Economics and industrial requirements and industrial infrastructure. So now we're going to take a brief look at the early... Starfleet ships. So we'll start with Generation 1, not Generation 0. Generation 0 is basically the post-Romulan War era. It's all those ships, you know, NX, Yorktown, Intrepid, Freedom Class, all of those ships, but we won't really pay much attention to those. We want to look at the Gen 1s. So the first Gen 1 we're going to look at is the Harcourt class, measuring in at 340 meters. This is quite a big ship. It's also quite a ungainly ship. This is not a fighting ship by any means. This is a colony ship. It's designed to repopulate uh, human colonies, you know, the human colonies that the Romulans nuked during the war. It's designed to see to the uh, recolonization, rejuvenation of those ecosystems. That's all it is. It's a very basic colony ship. Uh, in terms of who developed it, it's a combination, really, of Vulcan and Denobulan design. Uh, you can see the Denobulan design in there is actually vertically opposed warp coils. So the, the warp coils are arranged sort of vertically opposed rather than horizontally opposed. But it's a combination of, it's a combination of Vulcan and Denobulan design. This is about 2180 we're talking here. The flagship of the era, the workhorse, is the Rockwell class. This is the replacement for the NX class, and it's got a real mix of technology. Obviously, there's strong human influences in there, but there's also Denobulan and Andorian influences as well. Well, you can see the Denobulan influence in the vertical 
uh, impulse drive, that's a very Denobulan thing. And then the overall uh, structure of the ship is quite Andorian. You just, you know, especially looking at the uh, the main hull, uh, there's a lot of Andorian parts in there. And the navigational deflect allows it to mount a very powerful deflector shield, which of course comes from Andorian technology. And then finally, we have the Discovery class. This was actually less pushed for by Earth and was more actually a project by the Andorians and Tellarites. They both wanted quite an aggressive uh, patrol ship and you can see a little bit of both. The semi-saucer design is very much a Tellarite uh, trope and the fins coming off of the nacelles, that's very much an Andorian design quality. And that was very much there to serve as a patrol ship for them. It was made use across Starfleet broadly, but Andorian and Tellarite crews really liked flying these ships, and it was basically designed by a joint group of Andorians and Tellarites. There was very there was there was the basic amount of human involvement, but it was very clearly a passion project for them. So the Gen 1 designs are the first joint builds and they still retain a lot of their identity. But once we get to the Gen 2 designs, which are things coming out a little bit later, late 22nd, early 23rd century, when we get to those, various technologies are far more integrated and homogenous. They've had a generation of working out how all these different components and design philosophies can meld together. Again, there's still some like, there's still some inclination towards the interests of one species or another. The Tellarites and Andorians are always going to like their more aggressive designs. The Vulcans and the Vulcans and Denobulans are always going to like more scientific designs. Humans are always going to like their sort of general purpose explorers. That's not really ever going to change, and certainly definitely not by the uh, mid-23rd century. The whole way that early Starfleet is run is really another matter in terms of who gets what kind of ships and how crews are allocated to ships. Um, that's a whole separate question and I won't go into that here. But certainly by 2240, um, all these technologies and all these systems and ideas and design philosophies are fully integrated going into the Four Years' War. That is something that, that you, will now, you can then tell that there is a great deal of, of homogenization at least with the current generation of Federation ships. But certainly by the time you get to that, they, they have had now practice in developing in a, and incorporating one another's technology into shared designs. So that is ultimately my explanation as to why Federation ships are all human. But really, what it boils down to ultimately is it's due to the open nature of human design architecture. Human ships were very primitive, and so they had just a very basic level of building blocks onto which other species could start adding their stuff. You cannot underestimate the amount of impact that the Romulan War had on the Coalition and early Federation. That really, really did drive the founding members towards this kind of design philosophy and towards this level of integration so early. Again, the Federation could have gone a hundred years with each species still maintaining disparate ship classes and different design styles. And then almost certainly it would have made the integration of forces, which was inevitable, it was inevitable, and it would have made it even more painful when it happened. So it's very fortunate in many respects that the Romulan War happened. It meant that the coalition members had to work together from the offset, that there wasn't really any space to kind of argue and be petty and blah, 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 well, I want this and I want this from this. And, you know, it was like, Earth's in trouble, the Romulans are attacking, and if Earth falls, we're next, we need to get our shit in gear. And so they did. Yeah, there's nothing like a a, a, a good war and the, the sudden realization that you might be next to um, get, you, uh, get you working very quickly. Just a final note is that really the sorcerer is actually the only design quality out of all the things humans tried. The humans had been experimenting with various other designs from the zeppelins to the warp deltas. They'd have been experimenting with a lot of different shapes and space frames. So to really say that the saucer was a human thing, 
it's a little bit it's a little bit arrogant like other races like for example the tellerites kind of knew that those kind of saucer shapes there's advantages and there's disadvantages and other races did or didn't make use of those kind of shapes all the other races had reasons for not using pure saucer designs but because for humans that was the best design available to them and everyone turned their industrial base towards making that it's actually quite a universal simple shape to manufacture and like i say different species still had their own preferences of classes that they would like to use so yeah these are my thoughts on why federation ships look human is this a satisfactory explanation do you have your own explanation uh, or do you believe in the missing link theory let me know in the comments below and i will see you guys in the next video thank you to my members my navox david reeves jeffrey ballard tully dt and rella my commanders miami jewels captain's quarters chase rector PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, and Mr. Fiegel. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, and Athy's Collection. And I thank all my loyal sub-lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.